I might give it a few more seconds, but shortly we'll get right into it. Okay, so we have four people, so let's get started. Uh, welcome back, this is the Java class one. I'm Eugene. And this week we're going to be talking about Java classes. So you might've heard me mention this a few times last week, but basically a Java class is some kind of structure and it can be defined by its name and its main method. So you kind of saw this before when you used the pre-written stub when you made your first Java class. And so what a main method is, is it's kind of where the program starts when you run an application. And you might think that all Java classes that you write might need a main method, but it's actually not the case. So it's only if you need to run the Java class as an application that it has a main method because not all code that you write is going to be directly run by the user themselves. So keep in mind this idea of a Java class, it'll be very important. And hopefully throughout this lecture, you'll get a better idea of what it is. And as we start, um, I just want to reiterate again that as you're learning computer science, as you're coding things on your own, the internet is always a valuable resource for learning how to do things. So if you just look up Java tutorials, you'll be sure to find some. I'll be posting these slides after the class. So these are a few places to get started. The first two are from the official Oracle documentation. And the last one is just a website. But if you ever have questions about Java syntax, or maybe in a few years, you get rusty on your Java syntax, you'll always be able to find these things online. And so let's get started with what makes Java unique, or I guess, what are some attributes that Java has? And the first thing that you'll observe, maybe if you played around with Java since last week, is that when you have variables, um, the names of the variables are case sensitive and the variables are also type sensitive. And so what this means is that once you declare a variable, which is what we did when we wrote a sentence like int x equals six. Let me pull up. The line that says int x equals six is what we call a declaration because you're declaring for the first time that you're going to have a variable named x. And so what we mean by type is this first word that comes before the name of the variable. And so we'll go over more types, but in this case, the type of the variable x is an int. And finally, it's case sensitive. So Hmm. Let me see if I have that code from last week that you wrote. So right now this will work, but if I type in like a capital X, since the case of the variable name has changed, it no longer works. It identifies that there's an error. Um, And what type sensitive means is if say, I want to make this um, a different type, we'll go over what these are, but if I make it a completely different type, it might work, it might not work. In this case, for reasons like um, the way characters are stored, it happens to be a number, but if I make it a completely different type, your code might not work. So make sure that when you're working with variables, Remember that Java is case sensitive, type sensitive. You need to declare variables, which means if I say we're to introduce a new variable called Z, 
is equal to three without ever declaring z in its own line. That also would not work. And finally, that every line that's not a code block needs to end with a semicolon. Another thing you can do in Java is to comment your code. So to make your code readable for other people, sometimes you might want to write your own sentence, like, hello. You might want to explain like what your program does. Or you might want to explain in each line what this line is supposed to do, which is very helpful even for yourself when you go back to code that you've written before. So the typical way to do that is just two forward slashes. And an alternative way to do that is just this asterisk and forward slash, which lets you kind of comment entire block. So as you're listening to the lecture, maybe start up Eclipse. I know some of you had that error last week that didn't let you run code, but for now, um, when we get to the first part where we'll write code, I'll address that. So we've been talking about these data types, but we haven't actually talked about what kind of data types exist. <clears throat> and so here's a short sampling of what kind of data types there are. All of these sentences, all of these lines are things that you could write and it would be syntactically correct in Java. And in a bit, you'll see what each of these things refer to. When it comes to variables, um, as you write more complicated programs, you'll start to run into things like mutability. The important thing to get from this is just that, in essence, a variable is just some data that has a name on it. And in some cases, you want to be able to change that. And sometimes you don't want to change that. And there are some keywords that you can use, which we might, might talk about later in the class. And so, all right, these are all things that we've talked about before. Variables need to have these specific properties. And you can give a variable any name as long as it follows a certain set of rules. So these are the rules that you need to follow when you're giving a variable a name. So far, we've used names like x and y, which are pretty straightforward since those are your standard math variables. But what you can also do which is interesting is that you can start with any letter of the alphabet and you can also use the underscore or dollar sign, which isn't very common. And in general, you won't really start variables with these characters. But what you cannot do is start your variable name with a number or a space or a special character. So if you ever write some code and it doesn't compile, make sure that your variable names are all correct. And hopefully it's a pretty simple rule that you'll be able to internalize when you write code. One convention thing that you'll run into as you start taking more classes is that um, whenever you define like a constant, something in your code that's not gonna change, maybe it's the number of like samples that you have in this data that you're analyzing, or maybe it's a universal constant for some physics code that you're writing, you'll usually label those with names that are all capitalized. And one last restriction is that you shouldn't name your variables any of these words because as you might notice, they have a special meaning in Java and it won't interpret it as being a variable name. In terms of relating this back to the APCS exam, um, the first unit is talking about primitive types. And so for the next few minutes, we'll be going and taking a deeper look into what the Java primitive types are. So take a good look at this table. We're gonna talk about each of these, or at least hopefully you'll be able to understand each of these. Um, the first one is the byte, which isn't really used that often, but fundamentally it's something that you'll know about. So I'm sure that you've heard that computers store all of information in binary numbers. There's zeros and ones that everything that you see has been translated through. And so a byte is kind of looking at that where you have 
a certain representation in your computer of zeros and ones. But for our purposes, all we see is that it stores a number, kind of like an int that we've seen before, just not very big numbers. And so going up in scale, after a byte, you have a short, which also stores whole numbers. You have an int, which stores whole numbers, and a long, which stores whole numbers. And they all have a varying like range of what number they can store. And if you want to go even bigger than long, which in general you won't, but if you ever do, there are other ways you can do that, like big int. And so most commonly you'll see int being used. And for our purposes, you won't really ever need to use long or short. Int is sufficient for your everyday needs. In terms of decimal numbers, numbers that are not whole numbers, we have two big options, which are float and double. And so the relationship between a float and a double is pretty similar to the relationship between a short and an int and a long. So a double is the most common one you'll use. When you're storing numbers, the most common data types that you'll probably use are doubles and ints. And then you also have this one called a float, which it also stores decimal numbers, but there's some things that you have to do to make it work in Java. So just to demonstrate, like I can say index is three. I can call double y is 3.14. And that's what you would do. In the case of a float, um, you have to do something a bit strange, which is you have to type the letter f afterwards. But this code won't output anything, but just to show you that it runs without, it doesn't have any errors. Um, this is all syntactically correct. And the last of these data types that we have here is the character, the, the care or the char, which stores a single character. So like the letter A or B or any of the ASCII values, if you're familiar with that standard. To tell you more about the care or the character data type, it's stored in your number kind of as a as a number, but it's translated using this standard called Unicode to a character that you're familiar with seeing, like a letter of the alphabet. So the way you'd write it is just like you have any of these, you use single quotations for a single character in Java. And you, you might have seen before that. In Java, you use um, double quotes for strings. So that's a simple way to remember. Just one letter is one quotes. Now we'll get into some, I guess, more conceptual ideas, which is that you cannot assign bigger type data to a smaller type. So if you remember from this table, we had kind of like this number of bytes that you have, which dictates like how big a number you can be stored. So if you were to write something like, um, you define a long, if I were to later use the long, as an integer, if I were to try to do some operation that would require the long to be turned into an integer, it would not let me because I can't assign the bigger one to the smaller type. But I can go the other way. So if I have an integer, I can kind of treat it as a long because I don't lose any data by treating the smaller data as a bigger one. So kind of to make sure, I guess to take a measure of the room, and see if you've been able to follow along. Um, I guess speak up or type in the chat. First of all, what's the difference between an int and a long? <laughs> 
right? So that's all true. A long is able to store um, larger numbers than an int. And so on a similar fashion, what's the difference between a float and a double? All right, so that's the general idea. Um, I see like, it seems like you've gotten it so far. Now, this is something interesting that I want you to try for yourselves. So if any of you have had, can I get a response in like chat or verbally, whether or not you're able to get Java to compile and run in Eclipse? Okay, I see one no. I see two no's. I think I remember Colin, you were able to. Alex, I'm not sure if I remember. Well, okay. One thing I want you to try, um, I know that we went through this a couple times together, but when you create a new class, I, um, what I want you to do is make sure you create the project without the module info.java file. So whether or not you leave that box, I want you to make sure you don't create it because I was testing it during the week and it seems like having that module, like that info file, can cause an error that was similar to the one you were having. So try that, write a simple like code, like just printing hello world or something and see if that works. In the event that that does not work, I have an alternative way for you to be able to follow along with the class activities. But hopefully that works. I want you to try it now. Let me know if you can get it, get something to run. And if not, just let me know. In the event that you're not able to get Eclipse to run. Um, I'll take another look at it at the end of class today, but for the duration of a lecture, you can go to this link. And so I pasted it into the chat for you. If you go here, there's kind of like an online compiler. So if you just click, try it yourself. On the left-hand side, you can write some Java code. And if you run it, it'll, it'll take some time, probably longer than it will to run on your own machine, but you'll be able to see what the output would be of any code that you put in on the left. So I'll give you a minute or two. Um, what I want you to do is first try to get Eclipse working. And once you have Eclipse working or decide to use the online Java compiler, I want you to try to write this experiment. So can you create a float X that is equal to 3.534 and a double Y that is equal to 3.534? And hopefully you know enough about declaring variables now that you can write those lines of code. I'll give you like two minutes to do that. And please let me know what your Eclipse Java status is. Okay, I see it, it, it worked for you. <clears throat> so Jack and Alex, just let me know what your current Eclipse Java status is and try seeing if you can create a float X of 3.534 and a double Y of 3.534. 
So Jack and Alex. Okay, Jack, I see it works now. That's a relief. And Alex, are you good? And if not, you can always use the online compiler, but having it in Eclipse is pretty nice. So you might have something that looks like this now in front of you. And the first thing you'll notice is that you get a little red squiggly line underneath this line. And it's kind of like if you've typed in Microsoft Word, you'll notice that like spelling errors or things like that are indicated. And so Eclipse does something like that for you. If it sees an obvious error, it'll mark it with this line for you. So look out for that when you're debugging your code. And if I try running it, in fact, it will display an error. And the error that you see is that it cannot convert from double to float. And so it's quite a peculiar property of Java that when it sees a decimal number, kind of by default, it just treats it as a double. And so what we said before about bigger data types not being able to put inside of smaller data types, the float, as we talked about, is a smaller data type than a double. So what the compiler is doing is it looks at 3.534, it sees a double and then tries to put it into a float and then it fails. So it's pretty weird. You wouldn't think that it does that, but there you go. What you do to resolve that is to type the letter F in your keyboard. And that tells it explicitly that this is meant to be a float and you can put it in a float. And so now this will run without error. At any point during this lecture, by the way, and all lectures, if you ever have questions, just stop me, speak up, type something in the chat. We'll move on to Booleans. Okay, I see Alex. So that's very relieving to know that you all have working Java. Booleans. Um, it's a data type and it can only have two possible values and those are true and false. It's pretty straightforward. You use the keyword Boolean to declare it. So a line that you might write is say, and you'll notice that it identifies the keyword true. So it knows what you're trying to say, true meaning one of the two possible values of a Boolean. What's interesting now is kind of where you can get Booleans from. So you might think that just being able to write true and false isn't that useful, but where it becomes very useful is when we combine it with something that's called an operator. So these are things that you've learned about in your math classes, things like whether things are equal, greater than, less than each other. So if you see these lines of code, you can hopefully see that it'll output false because X, which contains the value six, is not greater than y, which contains the value of 11. In terms of operators, I think it would be valuable if you took a moment here to go to this website, as it contains a list of most of the important operators that you'll use. Um, I'll briefly go through these with you just one by one, but. If you want to go on your own pace, the link is in the chat. And so the arithmetic operators are things you're probably familiar with. These are addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Something interesting to note about division is that it might not behave exactly the way you expect. So let's say that I type something like int x is equal to five and int y is equal to two. Um, and after that, let's say that I want to print what x divided by y is. So just based on what you know about CS and math, like what do you think is the result of this? 
guess take a guess or try it and just tell me the answer or anything. Good catch. It's a bit of a trick there. So what will this print? Okay, I see 2.5. Anyone else wants to take a guess? This is your last chance because I'm about to run it. And you'll see two. So what happened? It's five divided by two, two. What happens is that different data types kind of have a different interpretation of what this operator means. And so I declared X and Y to be ints. So although the forward slash means division, it'll interpret it to be integer division because it's working with objects that are integers. And so what integer division does basically is it does division, but it gives you an output that's also an integer, which is pretty useful depending on your circumstances, but it might not be exactly what you want. If you wanted to get 2.5, what you would do is declare something like double x is five and double y is two. And once you do that, you'll see that you get the expected behavior because now it's not doing integer division, it's just doing division with doubles, which gives you decimals. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, these next operators are also things that you may have heard about if you've done some that kind of math. So the modulus is the modulo operator and it returns the remainder. So if I divide by five by two, I'll get the remainder of what you get when you divide five by two. So quickly predictions in chat for what this code will return. See one answer. Any guesses? Or try it yourself and write the correct answer. What we're doing is we're dividing five by two and we're taking the remainder. Right, so remainder one and what you end up getting is one, which is the remainder when you divide five by two. So that's the modulus. Increment and decrement we'll talk about later, but what it does is it adds one or subtracts one from the value of your variable. Next, you have these assignment operators, which I'll also talk about later, but you've already seen the equal operator, which you've used all the time when you're declaring your variables. So int x equals three, and x equals five, the equals is an assignment, and it's just telling you that the value of x should be equal to five. You also have these operators, which do, are basically a combination of your arithmetic operators with the assignment. So this line explains pretty much what it does. Plus equals just means X plus whatever is on the right-hand side. So I can type something like X plus equals two. And so this, is, this line is equivalent to if I just typed X equals X plus two. And you'll see as you expect, the value will be seven. Comparison operators, this is what we were talking about with the Booleans and where Booleans can arise from. So very often you'll want to compare things like this. So I might write something like Boolean B is equal to whether or not X is greater than Y. So depending on whether or not this is true, 
it'll output the condition of whether or not x is greater than y. So in this case, x has a value 5 and y has a value 2. So you get a true Boolean. The last one is logical operators. And so these we'll see later on when we write things like if statements and we get into iteration. But for now, just think of it as working exactly like the words and, or, and not. It's just like typing that. In the example here, this is checking whether or not x is less than 5 and x is less than 10, or x is less than 5 or x is less than 4. And since I know most of you have done Python before, so you're probably familiar with some of what these operators really do. Here we'll get into something that's a bit puzzling, and it has to do with the increment and decrement operators. So what's interesting is you can actually use the increment and decrement operators before or after the variable itself. So both of these are syntactically correct, but they have slightly different behavior. The ultimate result is that x gets incremented by 1. But when you write plus plus x, it does the incrementation before you use the value x. And x plus plus is kind of the opposite, where you use x and then increment it. That might not make a whole lot of sense now, but when we see it in context, hopefully it'll begin to clear up. So here's a bit of a puzzle for you. Um, you see these four lines of code. And so what I want to do is go through each line one by one and just go over predicting what the output will be. So we'll start with the first line, which is just int x is equal to 6. And we'll have a print statement so we can see what happens. So very quickly, we'll just go through um, what's the expected output of this. Hopefully, it's an instant response. Which you can type in chat. OK, all right. So the first part's a bit straightforward. Then you get int y is equal to x plus plus. Okay, um, I can put the code in chat. It might not be that easy to copy paste multiple lines. Or I'm not sure if that works because of the white space, but one line at a time if it saves you some time. So we're on line two of the four. Can you all see my eclipse, by the way, as I'm screen sharing? That would have been pretty awkward if I just stared at my slides while talking. Yeah, so, yeah. okay. So take a moment, think about what this does and what you know about the increment operator, or try it yourself and type in chat what you think the output will be of this segment of code. We know that just the first line will result in x being 6, which is correct. So just what happens with line 7? And when I see a response in chat, I'll move on. There's an error. Interesting. I guess at this point, at the risk of spoiling the answer, there is indeed an error. <laughs> 
And that's because I'm used to writing in languages that are not Java. So if you replace that comma with a plus sign, it'll probably work. I'll just format it a bit to make it look nicer. But the result is y is 6 and x is 7. And if you think about that, hopefully that makes sense. We use the increment after the variable. And so what it does, it assigns y the value of x, which is 6. And then it increments the value of x, so x becomes 7. All right, hopefully you're able to follow that. And we'll toss in another variable now. We have the line int z is equal to plus plus x. So this is kind of demonstrating what happens the other way around when you use the increment before the variable. So take a moment, take a moment to think about it. Maybe write down if you need with pen and paper what the values of the variables are. And when you think you have an answer, just tell me what z is at least, or what all the variables are. And being able to think through like iteration and incrementation of variables will be very useful when maybe you have an exam question that asks you to trace the output of a loop, or maybe you're just trying to debug your own code and you're trying to figure out what the variables mean. So when I see an answer in chat, I'll move on. And something you can keep in mind is that what happens after the first two lines, we already know because we just tried it. Y is six and X is seven. All right, I see one prediction. So last call for predictions. And we'll run it. And what we get is z is 8, y is 6, and x is 8, which matches the predictions. So good job there. For If you want an explanation of how that happens, uh, we already knew that y is 6, and we didn't do anything with y this time. Then what we do is we first increment x. So x goes from 7 to 8, which explains why x is 8. And then z is assigned that value of 8. Um, last line, this is perhaps the trickiest one. I know it took me a while to figure out what this would output, but we're going to type x plus equals plus plus x. This one might be tricky, but just think through it the same way you did the other ones. And when you have a prediction, type it in the chat and I'll move on. Fourteen. Okay. This is a big one. So if anyone else wants to take a guess before we run it. Last call. Okay. So in this case, it turns out to be 17. Um, so we'll kind of trace through the logic together. When we left off of this line, we had x is equal to 8. And so what happens is first that 8 gets incremented because you have a plus plus x. So you have 
nine. But what this line of code is really equivalent to is x is equal to x plus 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 x. So it's really happening. You start with the eight in x and the nine that x becomes. And when you add them together, you get 17. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a brain twister. But if you can think through things like this, you'll be very well prepared for problems that you might see later on. Here's a few more outputs that are hopefully a bit simpler. I see Alex. Um, something you can just do is have three print statements that are just like system dot print L and X. And hopefully if you just keep track of which is which like this, you don't need to worry about like formatting text or anything. It'll just print out the numbers. And so hopefully that helps. This one I won't go through and type in Eclipse each time, but um, for the first one, I want to see some answers for what int z is 12 mod 3. Remember that what this operator does is it divides 12 by 3, and then it re returns you the remainder of what you get when you do that division. Okay, I see one answer. So in this case, what happens is you divide 12 by three. And so 12 divided by three is four with a remainder of zero. And so if this were division, what you get is four, but since it's the modulus operator, what happens is it returns you the zero, that is the remainder that you get when you do the division. So, we know now that z is 4. So what happens now knowing these two values when you write boolean b is z is greater than t? So tell me what the value of b is right after this line. And if you want. For each of these, just what do you think the responses will be? Remember that a Boolean has two possible values, which is true and false. So I see false for the first one, which makes sense to me since four is not greater than six. Any thoughts on the next one? This is that Z is greater than three and T is equal to six. Okay, and I'm not sure if the falses are for that question or this question. But in this case, if you look at z, it currently has a value of 4. And so 4 is greater than 3. So this part will be true. And it's comparing that with whether t is equal to 6, which also happens to be true. And so since you have a true statement and a true statement, the result will eventually be that. Yes, 12 mod three is in fact zero. I'm not sure why I wrote the comment that it's four, but it's an excellent catch. Z is not greater than three as it turns out. And so it's a false statement and a true statement. And so you get false. So it seems like you guys are now better at this than I am. For the last one, just type in your response. All right, I see true. And that's how it goes. Since the OR operator just needs one of these conditions to be true and T is equal to six, you will get true. 
So this was a pretty fast overview of the types in Java. So at this point, if you have questions about any aspect of what we've talked about today, which are the different primitive types, the EPCS exam, and the various operators, um, feel free to ask them. I'll give you a moment to kind of digest what we just did and maybe to write your own code. Or look through some of the tutorials, but for a couple of minutes, just take a moment, ask any questions you have. Can be about anything, including maybe CS classes in the future. If there's anything I went over too fast and you want me to talk about again, I'm happy to do that too. So if there are no questions, I'll go into kind of the bonus topic for the day, which will be bits and bytes. Um, before we do that, in case that goes over the length of the class, I just wanna introduce you the first homework assignment. So by next week, just find some time during the week to answer this prompt. The slides will be posted after this class at some point today. And so you can just come back and access these. And so the prompt is that in most parts of the world, they use Celsius to measure temperature. And there's a known conversion formula between Celsius and Fahrenheit. So what I want you to do for next week is to just write a simple Java program that can convert the temperature from Fahrenheit to a degree Celsius. You don't have to worry about fancy things like user input or an interface or anything like that. It can just be very simple you edit the code value itself to interact with the code. Or if you feel more motivated, you can try to figure out how to do user input as well. But you can find some formula for the conversion between Fahrenheit and Celsius. And I want you to use what you know to be able to take that value and convert it to a different value. What I mean by like, don't worry about user input is you can just start off by having something like um, double the input is equal to, um, let's say 212 Fahrenheit. And so it's not perhaps a functional piece of software that would be easy to use, but if I wanted to test a different value, I should just be able to change in the code. If I just change this, that would be how I interacted with the code. So down here somewhere, it'll be your code and at the end, you should have some kind of system.out.print line that has um, your output of some kind, which should be the temperature in Celsius. Does everyone understand the assignment? If you do not, just say something now. And if not, we'll be moving on to the bonus lesson. Okay, guess you're all good to go. So something I glossed over when we first introduced primitive types was bits and bytes. And the simplest way to interpret it is that within your computer, um, everything is made out of like 
at this at the most fundamental level, it's all made out of um, gates. And so a computer just knows whether or not these units of electronics are storing a high voltage or a low voltage, which is represented as the number zero or one. And so every computer at the lowest level of its architecture has instructions that are meant to manipulate these values of zero or one. But from a human perspective, it's not very useful because there are so many zeros and ones that you have to keep track of and you don't really know what they mean until you can produce some kind of human readable format. But the motivation for why we want to know about bits and bytes is that at the lowest level, this is what your computer is doing. So a byte is a unit of data that's eight binary digits long. So I guess as a show of hands, just let me know if you're familiar with different base number systems, if you've worked with binary before, or maybe for like math, math tests or competitions, you've used different base number systems. Anyone? Just say no or yes. OK, so we'll go over what binary numbers are then. Let's see, it's a good way to do this. So let's start off with how we represent decimal numbers. So first of all, we just have our digits. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, so on, up through 9. And each of these just represent the concept of a number that they are. So 9 represents the concept of nine things. Then we go up to 10. And this is where it gets a bit tricky because we have the number 1 and the number 0. But it's not representing either 1 or 0. It's representing the concept of 10 things, like the number of fingers you have. And so what happens here, what we traditionally use is called a decimal or base 10 system. And the way this is represented is you have 10 distinct digits, which are the 0 through 9. And once you go above 9, the way you represent numbers larger than 9 is to go to your second digit. So like you've learned about the 1's place, the 10's place, the 100's place. And the way that works is once you go to the second digit, each number represents a 10 instead of a 1. So the number 10 represents 1, 10, and 0, 1s, which is why it's the concept of 10. And then 11, which is 1, 1, represents the concept of 1, 10, and 1, 1, which is 11. Once you reach 99, you run out of things that you can do. So you need to go up to the third digit, which is your hundreds place. And so what happens is when you have 100, you're representing that you have 1, 100, 0, 10s, and 0, 1. So what binary numbers do is it kind of reduces the number of digits that you have to work with. Instead of having 0 through 9 as digits, you only have 0 through 1 as digits. And the reason it's called binary is because you only have two digits, which are 0 and 1. So based on that reasoning, 0 represents 0 things, just like it always does. 1 represents 1 thing, like it always does. But then after this, you run out of digits because you only have 0 and 1 as your digits. So just like with decimal, you go to the next digit. So you need two numbers now, and you go up to 1, 0. And so what this represents now is that you have one, two, and zero ones. So the first one represents how many twos you have, and the second one represents how many zeros you, how many ones you have. So this would be two in decimal. If you want to count up again, you go to one, one, and this becomes three in decimal because you have two ten, you have one, two, and you have one, one, which is three. After this, you've already reached the top. This is the equivalent of like 99 in decimal, not numerically, but like the, con the concept of running out of digits. 
So you need to go to the third decimal place, which is now the fours. So three was the most was the largest number you can represent in base two with two decimals, but now you have three digits. So the first one represents how many fours you have, which is one. And so you have one four, which means this is four in decimal. Um, it's a lot to take in and it's conceptually kind of difficult to grasp at first, but if you understand where this is going, see if you can figure out what the binary value of the representation 110 is. And just tell me what that number would be in decimal, just the normal number we talk about. So as we're going, like 100 is 4, 101 is 5. And I'll move on when I see someone respond in chat. Great, right, six. And you can see like, this was five. And we ran out of digits in the ones place. So we went to one, one, zero, which becomes six. So next question, what is one, zero, one, zero? I guess the answer is a bit spoiled there, but convince yourself that this has that value. So you have zero ones, one two, zero fours, and one eight. So hopefully you follow that that becomes 10. And- Wait, can, you, can you explain that again? Sure. So when we have a decimal number, each place, this is the ones place, this is the tens place, this is the, whoops, this is the hundreds place, this is the thousands place, and this is the ten thousands place, right? Okay. So the way we get those names is that each of these is a power of 10. So one is 10 to the zeroth power, 10 for your tens place is 10 to the first power, three in the hundreds place, is in the hundreds place because 100 is 10 to the second power. Two is in the thousands place because 1,000 is the third power, and so on. So if I have a number like this, this is the ones place still because two of the zero is one. This is now the so-called tens place, but it doesn't represent a 10 anymore. It represents a two because we're in binary. This is the fours place, the eights place, and the sixteens place. So whether or not there's a one or zero there just tells you whether or not you add the place of the number to your total. So I hope that made sense. Um, definitely takes some time to get used to. Yeah, each place is basically double the previous one because we're in base two, so each exponent is basically double the previous one. Um, yeah. So all of this is to say how we introduce uh, bits and bytes. So using this kind of system of mathematics, you can kind of understand how everything that a computer does can be represented in just two digits, zero and one. And so kind of what we were talking about with the number of places you have, the amount of information that you can store increases the more digits you have, which makes sense because if you just have one digit, it can only store whether or not it's a zero or a one. If you have two digits, as you can see, there is four possibilities. Um, if you have three digits, there is eight possibilities and so on. So you might notice a kind of a pattern here. So if you read the slide, or if you follow the reasoning, one binary value can store two numbers, zero and one, and it leads all the way to three binary numbers storing eight numbers. So 
a byte is basically eight binary numbers. So what is the largest number value that you can hold with a byte? And kind of, we'll think through this out loud. If a byte has eight numbers, Um, my first thought is making them all one is the way to get the biggest number. So this question is kind of asking, what is the value of the binary number that is eight ones? Um, if you have an idea or if you're stuck, just say something in the chat and I'll move forward. Another way to approach the problem is kind of to make this observation that the slide makes, which is that you raise two to the power of the number of digits you have. Uh, you don't have to calculate the exact number. You can write it in terms of the exponent, but maybe you can get one response and then we'll start wrapping things for the class. Anyone? Okay, I see a 255. And yeah, I'll just tell you that that is the largest number that you can store. If you wanted to store 256, you would be hitting two to the eighth. So you need an extra digit to be able to represent it. Don't worry too much if this was a bit um, the specifics of working with binary numbers isn't necessarily something that will be on the APCS exam or in your first CS classes, but if you're interested in computer architecture or kind of the electronic side of com computation, or even if you're just interested in like mathematics and the idea of numbers, it's pretty interesting topic that's related to this week's lecture. Other than that, um, remember that there is this assignment for next week. So hopefully next week I can maybe have one of you share your code, make sure it, you can check that it works. If you have any questions, I believe my email is on the top of the slide, which I'll be posting. And if there are no other questions for the week, I'm really glad everyone got their Java and Eclipse working on their own computers. But um, that's all there is for the class. Next week, we're meeting again at 5.15, but the class will be dismissed slightly early instead of the usual 6.20. I'll dismiss at six o'clock because I have to attend an exam. Otherwise, that's it.